we ask you to join in with us and you know the songs we sing, uh, praises that we're doing. We ask you for your help today. And we just thank you for being here. And at this time, we'll uh, have devotion. And Brother Lee will lead us in scripture as always. And for those that can, will you stand for the, uh, the reading of God's word? And those that can't stand, just stay where you are. All right, I'm going to read this morning from Colossians 1, verses 12 through 14. It reads, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. <coughs> what delivered us from the power of darkness and it has trans translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in him we have redemption through his blood even forgiveness of sin it's Colossians 1 verses 12 and 14 and God had a blessing to the readers hears and doers of his word Amen. Amen you may be seated Pray, pray. Father God, we thank you for our lives, health, and strength. Thank you, Father, for last night's lying down and this morning early rising. Thank you, Father, for looking over us and keeping us safe, Lord. Thank you for shelter that you give us. Thank you for the food that you give us to eat. We just thank you for everything you do for us. Father God, we're having things going on in our country that we never seen or heard of before. And we ask you, Lord, to look in on these that are unjust and yes. put the love of God in their hearts, Lord. We pray for the sinner man that's walking up and down the streets not knowing you in the importance of his own sin. We pray for forgiveness for these. Yes. And then, Lord, we ask you for forgiveness of our sins that we come short of sometime and we we ask you for forgiveness of this today, Lord. We ask you to bless this day as we go through this day, Lord, and this moment in time. We're looking forward for tomorrow so we have another day to serve and glorify your name, Father. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy on us, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's how song is. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all he is is gone. Because Because I 
Thank y'all for joining us. As we always say, today's a good day to help somebody. Amen. There's always somebody that's less fortunate than we are or you are. Amen. So today's a good day to call somebody that's sick and shut in and can't help themselves or don't have food to eat or clothes to wear. All right. Today's a day to share with somebody. And as we leave this place, think about somebody that you can share with, somebody that's sick in bed that can't come out of their house. And you can maybe go by and see them or just give them a telephone call today. Yes, sir. And that will be a blessing to them. We love you and we thank you for joining us and God bless you. Amen. 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 Let's continue with that theme of because he lives. The songwriter said he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me. Long life's narrow way. Amen. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me. A long life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to import. You ask me how I. No, he lives. He lives within my heart. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hands of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me, along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to implore. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King, the hope who all who find, the help who all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to implore. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my He lives yes, sir. within my heart. Jesus yes. said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send you a helper. And the helper is the Holy Spirit who lives within the believer. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. Yes. You want to say good morning, St. Paul? Yes, sir. Good morning. Amen. And we want to say good morning to those who are watching by means of social media, Amen. Facebook, YouTube, and other uh, means of social media. We thank you for joining us in this worship service today. This is the second Sunday of the month of uh, October, November. 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 All right. And so we thank God for uh, another beautiful day. Yes, the weather's gotten cooler outside. The leaves are falling. Mm -hmm. And so we thank God that he's allowed us to see this transition in the weather. Uh, we used to complain about how hot it is. Now we're complaining about how cold it is. All right. uh, I thank God that he doesn't listen to our complaints. Amen. 
Amen. The weather will be all over the place. Amen. Yeah. And so we thank God that uh, he knows what the earth needs. Oh, yeah. uh, it needs just cold weather, just like it needs the hot weather. Yes, sir. And so we thank God that you're here today to worship the Lord. Um, we're going to uh, continue to move forward in worship. Um, one way that we worship God is through singing. Uh, I do pray that you have come to bless the Lord Amen. through the songs. <clears throat> the choir is going to come. They have some uh, prepared songs uh, that they've worked on, and we're going to come and bless the Lord through those songs. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. The Bible says, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So as the choir comes with these songs of praise, we ask that you would also solicit your voice in praise to the Lord. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. <laughs> Oh, well, in my 
brothers and sisters to turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, this is message, I believe, number 31. 
from the book of First Corinthians, from the series Order in the Church. Uh, Paul is writing to encourage, also to correct uh, some sinful uh, practices in the church at Corinth, a church that he had established um, in the city of Corinth, stayed there 18 months with them, preaching and teaching them God's word. And so he's writing this first letter because he's heard some things that are going on in the church that, that needed to be corrected. And there, we know that there's not a perfect church. Uh, the church is um, made up of um, sinners saved by the grace of God. Yeah. And sometimes we revert back to our old lifestyles, our old habits, our old addictions. We try to bring the old life back into something new. Amen. And so when we see that something that is taking place in the life of the church that may cause others to stumble, that may cause others to revert back to sinful lifestyles, they need to be addressed. Amen. And uh, it's God's uh, church, but God has given responsibility to the pastors and to the leaders of the church Amen. to correct sinful habits among God's people. Some people embrace uh, um what we would call um, when you need to correct some people, and some people don't at all. They will get offended. That's right. um, they will leave the church. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm pretty sure there were some people in Corinth that probably thought about leaving Corinth Baptist Church right. <laughs> and going down the Sweet Union, <laughs> down the street, because Paul dealt with some issues in their lives that needed to be corrected. And, uh, you know, it's, it's in the life of every uh, child of God that we have habits and sins Amen. that God uh, wants to deal with. Uh, the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he what? Yes. He chases. Yes. Amen. Yes. And so uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. I will read from the New King James. I also may refer to the New Living Translation. But Paul is addressing this issue in chapter, what, 12, 13, and 14, the issue concerning spiritual gifts. Uh, keep in mind that the Corinthian culture was a pagan culture. They worshiped idol gods. And part of their religious practices before some of them got saved, they would go down to the temple, they would drink a lot, get drunk, and then they would be induced by these evil spirits Amen. And they would call that worship. They would go to the temple and sleep with prostitutes. And all of that was part of their worship. Yeah. And, and to get involved into these demonic spirits. And some of them would try to bring these old practices into the new lifestyle. And so that's what Paul is dealing with. Uh, you got people who have been saved by the grace of God, but they remember how they used to. Right. Is, isn't it still amazing when some of us as Christians say, oh, those were the good old days. Yeah. Now we're talking about our lifestyles of sin. Amen. When we were sleeping with Tom, Dick, and Harry, Sue, Jane, and Sally, getting drunk every night. Amen. Going to the clubs every Saturday. And then when somebody knocked on your door and said, if you live here, you're going to go to church Sunday morning. Amen. You were pretty mad. Right. But Paul is dealing with the issue of this the church because he loves the church. And, and when preachers, amen, uh, proclaim God's word, they do, we don't do it because we hate the church. We do it because we love the church, the amen. people of God. And there are some things here that simply needs to be corrected. And one of these things that they was having on going on in the church was these uh, spiritual gifts. They were confused about spiritual gifts. They thought that some gifts were greater than others because some of these gifts reminded them of their old pagan practices where they would um, induce, be induced by these pagan spirits, these demonic spirits, and they would, would have these utterance of speech. And so now Paul having to deal with the issue of tongues and prophecy. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 through five for our scripture reading, but we will also cover more scriptures in the text. He says, now pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may what prophesy. But he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. 
He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the preacher's going to preach about tongues versus prophecy, which is great. Amen. Tongues versus prophecy, which is great. Father God, we come. We thank you now for this opportunity to stand once again before your people to open up your word. And God, by the power of your spirit, try to explain spiritual truth to spiritual people. We ask, Lord, that we would be open, receptive to the word of God so that it may create change in our lives. We pray that it will convict the sinner for his need to be saved, that he will repent of his sins, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died, that he was buried and raised on the third day so that they may be saved through faith in his name. And Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, ushers, for serving. Again, I want to talk about tongues versus prophecy. You know, when, when you see the word versus, you mean that there is an opposition, two oppositions, Amen. two um, battles that are going on. Uh, it always reminds me of uh, Ali versus Frazier, or Ali versus Norton, or Tyson's, Tyson versus um, Evander Holyfield. There's two oppositions, and you, you meet together in a ring to define who is the greatest. And so that's what we see here when we have this, uh, this battle in regards to what is the greatest gift that the church was um, in confusion about. You know, if I was to ask any Christian, which spiritual gift is greater, would it be prophecy or speaking in tongues, I would uh, get different, amen, opinions, different answers. Some would say, well, it depends on your denominational view. Because some denominational views say, well, tongues is a greater gift than speaking, uh, than, than what prophesying or preaching the word of God. And so it all depends, preacher, it depends on what my denomination teaches that, amen, that if you don't speak in tongues, because some denominations believe that if you don't have the gift of tongues, you're not saved. You're not filled with the spirit of God. Right. And so if I were to ask, what's the greatest gift, speaking in tongues or preaching or prophecy, some would say it all depends on your denominational view. Some Christian denominations again teach that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved or you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of the scriptures, amen, they use to back up this teaching or this viewpoint is found in Mark chapter 16 verse 15. Amen through 18. If you have your Bibles open, look at Mark chapter 16 verses 15 through 18 because some denominational views say that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And I believe that one of the uh, scriptures that they build this, amen, this doctrinal belief upon is Mark 16, 15 through 18 when Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel. To every creature, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And here's the key verse that they base that denomination of view on, verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. 
They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so when Jesus gave this, amen, this, this commandment to go and preach the gospel, the emphasis, brothers and sisters, is not on speaking in tongues, but the emphasis that Jesus is stressing to the church and to the believers that they go and what? Preach the gospel. Because the Bible says here the first thing that he commands them to do, according to that verse, go into the world and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. And guess what? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And so they leave out all of that and they skip to verse 17 and they go to the point that says, and they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will be no, by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, brothers and sisters, if you really take this into context, this is referring to the apostles. Right. Because you remember that when Paul was on the island of Malta, the Bible says it was cold, it was winter, they had just experienced a shipwreck, and guess what? Paul, along with the other prisoners, were picking up sticks, the Bible says, and when he was picking up sticks, he put it on the fire, and guess what? Paul was bitten by a serpent. The Bible says, and they looked at Paul and thinking that he would drop dead. But then when he shook it off, yeah. they claimed that he would be a God. And so when Jesus said some of these things would occur, they occurred in the life of the apostles. From this scripture, some believers have built a doctrinal belief that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Or you don't have the gift of the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues. But the Apostle Paul asked this question in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29 through 30, when he spoke about spiritual gifts, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 29 through 30, Paul asked the question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all of you teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Y'all see it? Yeah. Paul is asking this rhetorical question because he already knows the answer. In other words, all of you in the church don't have the gift of miracles. All of you in the church don't have the gift of healing. All of you do not have the gift of being an apostle. All of you do not have the gift of being teachers or prophets. And not all of you have the gift of speaking with tongues. So the answer to that rhetorical question, Paul, is no. Not every believer has the same spiritual gift. Paul had already explained this in chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, when he wrote, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences in ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. In other words, Paul just gave us a picture of the triune God. Look at the text again. He said, but the same spirit. He said, but the same Lord. Then he said, but the same God. In other words, the Godhead is involved in distributing spiritual gifts to the body of Christ. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretations of tongues. He says in verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, it is all of these spiritual gifts, distributed to each one individually as he wills. Right. In other words, the Holy Spirit is involved in giving you your spiritual gift. So if you don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, tell your neighbor it's not your fault. Because God didn't give you the gift of speaking in tongues. And so what God give, doesn't give me, 
I'm not accountable for. No. But guess what? The gift that God does give me, I'm accountable to use that. Yes, amen. Y'all believe that? Say amen. amen. In other words, the gift that God gives you, you are accountable to use to help build up the body. But if God does not give you the gift, such as speaking in tongues, then it's not your fault that you're not able to speak in tongues. So if you go to a church and the church, amen, that you go to a visit tells you that if you don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, then you're not saved. Tell them that God didn't give me the gift of speaking in tongues. Amen. Amen. I remember one time we, the members of our church went to a funeral to, of another denomination to support one of our members who had lost a loved one. And then one of the members of their church told us, if we don't go to their church, we're not saved. If our name of our church is not in the Bible, we're not saved. If we don't speak in tongues, we're not saved. And if you don't know the Bible, you will believe such nonsense. But Paul says not all of us have the gift of speaking in tongues. And if we were to, amen, rank spiritual gifts in their importance to the church, look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28. He says, and God has appointed these in the church first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and variety of tongues. Y'all see it? In other words, Paul says when it comes to the spiritual gift, if we want to rank them in importance, he said the gift of tongues is last when it comes to spiritual gifts. So when we come now to chapter 14, Paul tells the believers in Corinth, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may what? Prophesy. According to verse 1 of chapter 14. In other words, the lack of love was the spiritual problem among the believers living in Corinth. It's not that they lack spiritual gifts. They lack love when it came to operating in their gifts. They were commanded to pursue love, to follow after love, to run after love, to eagerly seek after love, the kind of love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. If you have your Bibles over, look at what Paul tells him what love is. He said, love suffers long in its kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, love is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it thinks no evil, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And so Paul said, since you guys are so enamored by spiritual gifts, I want you to pursue something greater, and that is the gift of love. Yes, Second, they were to desire what spiritual gift. That is to be zealous in the pursuit of something that is good. All spiritual gifts help build up the church, but the gift of prophecy serves the church in a way that the gift of tongues cannot and that it what edifies the entire church, not just one member. So, so is the greater gift speaking in tongues, or is it prophecy? Now, according to Paul, he says, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may what? Prophesy. Now, the word prophecy means, in the Greek, it means to foretell. It means to preach. It means to proclaim the truth of God's word. It means to teach the word of God. It means to what refute. It means to reprove. It means to admonish. It also means to comfort others through preaching. Right. In other words, when Paul wrote the church concerning what the resurrection of the dead and what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, about those who have fallen asleep in the Lord. 
For the Lord himself shall what descend from heaven with the shout, with the trumpet sound, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And they that remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall for always be with the Lord. And then he says, and therefore comfort one another right. with these words. And so prophecy, brothers and sisters, it edifies, it encourages, it builds up, it comforts the entire body of Christ. Now Paul contrasts the gift of tongues versus that of prophesying or preaching God's word in verse 2 through 5. Now when someone speaks in tongues, the Bible says they would speak to God and not to men. Look at verse 2 of the text. He said, but he who speaks in tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Y'all see it? And so when you have the gift of speaking in tongues, you're speaking to God and not to men. Right. He says also, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Look at verse 4 of the text. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. In other words, he builds up himself. Amen. He strengthens himself. But he does not what strengthen or build up anybody else in the church because nobody else in the church knows what he's saying. All right. For example, if I begin to speak in Spanish right now, how many of y'all understand Spanish? Fluent Spanish. So would it do you any good if I be say, si, senor, also, la vista, movigo, the better, and hallelujah. Now, would y'all understand what I'm saying? No, you would probably understand hallelujah because hallelujah is a universal word. All of the world, all the saints of God understand the word hallelujah, which means praise. It builds me up. Nobody except the one who's speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues does not edify the church unless what someone is there to interpret what is being said. Yes, sir. He says in verse 5, unless indeed. Paul says, what does he says in verse 7 of chapter 14, even life is instrumental. One will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It is the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you're saying? You might as well be talking to empty space. There are many different languages in the world and every language has meaning. But if I don't understand, Paul is saying here that when you come together and you have the gift of speaking in tongues, make sure that you can interpret the gift or that someone else in the church has the gift of interpretation. If not, you're only edifying yourself. If not, you're only speaking to God and not to men. All right. If you speak in tongues, the church can't say amen All right. to what you're talking about in verses 13 through 17 of the text. Look at that. Look at verse 13 and 17. So anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, and I will pray also in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the spirit, how can those who don't understand praise God along with you? In other words, how can they say amen? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you are saying? You will be giving thanks very well 
but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. Paul says in verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to have others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. And so here was this debate about speaking in tongues. But Paul said, but if you speak in tongues, guess what? You edify yourself. You speak to God. Nobody else can say amen because they don't have a clue of what you're saying. That's right. Have y'all ever been in a church service in the first day the preacher said, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. Let the church say amen again. Right? You ain't giving nothing up for us to agree to. The word amen means say, yes, I agree. And Paul says, if you get up here and you begin to speak in a language that people don't understand, how can they say amen? All right. So the Paul is saying, and finally, tongues are a sign to unbelievers. Look at verse 22 of the text. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the believer to benefit the believer, not the unbeliever. Yeah. And so Paul is saying here, brothers and sisters, if you use the gift of tongues, Tongues is a sign for those who are unsaved, not for the saved. However, prophecy exhorts and comforts everyone. Look at verse 3 of the text again. So now here's the contrast of those who speak in tongues versus those who prophesy. But one who prophesies what strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. God uses the spoken word to what? Strengthen his people, to encourage his people, and to comfort his people. Yesterday, we went to a funeral. And through the funeral, the preacher stood up to use God's word to strengthen God's people, to comfort God's people, and to encourage God's people. That's what we need in a time of what discouragement that's when we need in times of what amen when we're crying and mourning the loss of a loved one we need the word of god amen, amen. heaven and earth will pass away but god's word shall abide forever yes. and so paul is saying here brothers and sisters when you what speak the word of god it edifies it comforts and it exhorts god's people everybody's being encouraged by the word it also edifies the whole church and not just one person. Look at verse 4 of the text again. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church because we all understand what is being said. Paul goes on to say prophecy is a greater gift than speaking in tongues. Look at verse 5. He said, I wish that all of you could speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. Why? Well, prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying right. so that the whole church may be strengthened. Mm -hmm. And so Paul also referred prophecy over speaking in tongues because everyone understand what he is saying. Right. And he could teach God's word to God's people by the gift of Prophecy. Look at verse 18 of the text. He said, prophecy is a greater gift because it strengthens and encourages God's people. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. Yeah. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words yeah. to have others in 10,000 words in an unknown language. In other words, God uses prophecy to convict not only what, amen, to convict the sinner also, of their need to be saved. Look at verse 24. Because Paul tells us in verse 22 that speaking in tongues is a sign for unbelievers, right. not for believers. Yes. Prophecy, however, is for what the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Look at verse 23. He says, in, in, even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church service and hear everybody speaking in an unknown language, they will think y'all are all crazy. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 24. But if all of you are prophesying, 
and an unbeliever or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of their sin and judged by what you say. And as they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring, truly God is here among you. All right. In other words, God uses prophecy, the spoken word, in a known language to people to convict them of their need for Jesus. And that's why it's so important that we proclaim God's word to the people. When people come to church, they want to hear from God. They don't want to hear your, uh, your thoughts, your opinions, your beliefs. They want to hear what God has to say. Amen. Because only God's word can lead them to be saved. Amen. The Bible says, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse what, 15, 16, he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who what believes. So Paul goes on to say God uses prophecy to convict the sinner of their need to be saved. Thus, we should desire the gift of what? Prophecy. That is, declaring the truth of God's word because it edifies the church, prophecy does. It edifies everybody in the church, but it also convicts the sinner for their need to be saved. And so while the Corinthians were having this great debate of tongues versus prophecy, Paul says, I wish that all of you would speak with prophecy. Amen. Because why? Prophecy edifies everybody. Prophecies give witness or bears witness to the word of God. It convicts the sinner and the sinner will cry out saying, what must I do to be saved? Let me give you an example as I close. The apostle Paul and Silas were in Philippi. And they were preaching the word of God in the marketplace. And there they met a demon-possessed girl. And the demon-possessed girl, the spirit in her, said, These are men of God who have were proclaiming to you the way to be saved. And the Bible says, and she followed Paul and Silas day after day, nagging Paul. And Paul finally turned to that spirit in that girl and said, I cast you out in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. All right. The Bible says, and when her owners heard what Paul and Silas had did, they, and their, their, their money-making scheme was over, they drove Paul and Silas before the magistrates and said, these men are teaching things contrary to the Roman beliefs. Uh -huh. They beat Paul and Silas and put them in jail, locked in stocks. And the Bible says, but at midnight, yeah. Paul and Silas were singing hymns and praising God. And the Bible says there was an earthquake and all the prison doors were open and all the prison chains were broken. And the jailer, supposing that all the prisoners had escaped, drew his sword to commit suicide. But Paul says, do yourselves no harm. We're here. And the Bible says, and the jailer called for light, ran down and stood before Paul and Silas on his knees saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. And Paul says, Believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your household, and you shall be saved. Yes. See, when we speak the word of God, when we talk about Jesus, it should convict the sinner around us for their need for Christ. Yeah. While we're so enamored about spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues and telling other Christians you're not saved because you don't have the gift of tongues, Paul says, I speak tongues more than all of you. All right. But he said, I would rather speak five clear words yes, right. than to speak in a language that nobody else can understand. Right. So which is the greater gift? Paul says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may what? Prophesy. Yes, sir. So what is the advantage? He says prophesy is what builds up the church. It edifies, it exalts, and it comforts all men. And so I wish that you would all prophesy, Paul says. I wish that you would all speak the language of love and tell people about Jesus. Father God, we come. We thank you today. 
Thank you for a clear revelation of your word. Lord, we have been uh, told that if we don't have the gift of tongues, we're not saved, we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. But I thank you that there's a record in the scripture that says not all have the gift of tongues, not all have the gift of miracles, not all have the gift of healing, not all have the gift of prophecy. Amen. But we thank you, thank you. that we can all share the word of God. Yeah. And when we share the word of God, sinners can be convicted of their sins and see their need for Jesus. And so Lord, help us to be a body of believers who tell people about Jesus. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching by way of Facebook and maybe you have been told that if you don't have the gift of tongues, that you're not saved. But the word of God tells us whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you may be wondering, well, what must I do? Admit to God that you're a sinner. Yes. Believe the gospel that Jesus Christ was buried, that he, that he was first crucified for your sins, that then he was buried, yes. and then he was raised the third day, yes. so that through his death, burial, and resurrection, you may have the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Call on his name and face say, Lord Jesus, I believe you to be the Son of God. I believe that you lived a perfect, sinless life. I believe that you went to a place called Calvary. You died for my sins, crucified on the Roman cross. And then they took you down from that tomb and they placed you, Lord God, from that cross into Joseph's new tomb. And you stayed there Friday, Saturday, but early Sunday morning. You rose from the dead with all power in heaven and earth in your hand. Yes. And you sit, you went back to heaven where you live and you sit at God's right hand. Yes. Thank you. And I believe that you're coming back to just the world and receive the church to yourself. Lord, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Yes. Forgive me of my sins. Save me, Lord Jesus. Yes. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Maybe if you're here today, maybe you prayed that prayer by means of Facebook or any social platform. Will you just put in the commentary that I received Christ as my Lord and Savior today. We want to welcome you to the family of God. Amen. And maybe you need to come and you need to recommit your life as a Christian. You've slacked off in your commitment to the Lord. Jesus tells this in the book of Revelations, you have left your first love. Amen. He said, then you need to repent and you need to redo the things that you did at first or else I will come and remove your lampstand. Amen. And maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. Whatever your decision and the doors of the church are open to receive you uh, as a child of God or as a recommitted child of God. Let us all stand. Let us all sing. Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. Lord, whatever.
Man. what he's doing. Thank you, Jesus. And God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Amen. We thank God for his word today. Sister Sidney. And I want to share some announcements with you. I want to say, first of all, 